I'm actually not going to talk about AIDS psychiatry today. I'm going to talk about uh, a different issue that bears on, uh, on omics in this way. One of the big problems that people alluded to this morning is the phenotype. And um, so one of, the, one of the problems we're having in medicine is that there are conflicting agendas in medicine. My agenda is to take one person at a time and get them well. So I take care of really sick people in the AIDS clinic who are psychiatrically ill, who won't take their medicines, who are spreading this epidemic illness, and I try to get them well. And when I want to give them a medication, I write a prescription for it, and I get told that medicine isn't covered. And I say, it's the same price as this other medicine that they were taking that they failed on. Why can't I give them this medicine, which costs the same thing? They say, well, it's not on the formulary. And four hours of my time gets sucked up into a fight, which I usually win, by the way, during which I could have taken care of 70 other patients so that some other company can save $10, wasting an enormous amount of my time and your resources to save 10 bucks. And these are conflicting agendas. And one of the things that happens with conflicting agendas is that um, the goal of getting people well gets divided up into little pots. So there's a psychiatry pot and there's an internal medicine pot. And if you have a psychiatric disorder complicated by a medical disorder, the psychiatry people say you can't get admitted to psychiatry of a medical illness. And the medical people say that's a psychiatry problem. And uh, nobody wants to admit you and you can't get care. So one of the places that this is being misused most is in evidence-based medicine. And I wanted to talk a little bit about evidence-based medicine today. Um, the what it is and the issues of validity and reliability in trials and then some of the potential misinterpretations of those trials to, uh, that, that are causing these kinds of conflicts and then um, finally to discuss the way the criteria that we use for diagnosing illnesses really profoundly affects what we find out and what we learn. Um, these are my disclosures. I have no relevant financial disclosures um, but I'll give you two irrelevant ones. I'm not sure this managed care thing is really as good as they say they are, and I think George Harrison was the best Beatle. <laughs> you, uh, you should always talk about what you work on. So um, these are uh, three gizmos that I worked, I worked on this guy. That's uh, Ichthyophis cotauensis. I wrote my uh, first paper on that bug. Um, that is a, a, an, an amphibian. That's a reptile, and that's a non-vertebrate worm. They all, you'll notice they all, this is an annelid, right? you notice the rings. That has rings. That has rings. In fact, these things all look very much the same. They all live underground. They all eat the same kind of food. And they all, if you dig them up, look awfully similar. But they're radically different. That's a frog. That's a lizard. And that's a worm. Um, this is a very specialized frog. That's a very specialized lizard. But nonetheless, uh, they are very different creatures. And in biology, in medicine, we run into this problem all the time. Somebody says, I'm anxious. Well, you could be anxious because you have a test the next day. You could be anxious because you have a mood disorder that interferes with your ability to enjoy things. You could be anxious because your parents are visiting you and you've been there for two weeks. Um, so there's a, a, a lot of reasons why people are anxious. And the treatment of their anxiety, their complaint, is radically different depending on why they're anxious. But the phenotype of anxiety is not the phenotype you're looking for. It's the phenotype of what's causing the anxiety that you're looking for. So um, this is a talk. I was a chair of an APA session on depression, and there was a guy who got up and he said, we should do a better job preparing our patients for treatment failure since we only get about a third of the patients well and about half improve at all. And I said, where did you get that idea? He said, well, look at the clinical trials data. And, uh, this is an example of that. So this is duloxetine, 60 milligrams versus placebo. This is one of the registration trials that got duloxetine on the market. So um, the placebo's in yellow, the duloxetine's in blue. This is the time to treatment, and this is the change in the Hamilton rating scale. Um, uh, that's the 17 rating scale, doesn't really matter too much. But look at this change. I would never spend $150 of your money a month for that. It's ridiculous. See? Well, a clinical trial is designed to do a very specific thing. It's designed to show that this drug is a little better than placebo. Now, you could design it to show it's a lot better than placebo. 
But you didn't design it to show a lot better than placebo. You designed it to show it was a little better than placebo. Because when you do it this way, it only costs you enough dollars to do it for nine weeks. You can stop the trial at nine weeks. Number two, you only have to get so many patients. And most importantly, number three, you use a subtherapeutic dose of antidepressants, 60 milligrams. This drug needs 120 milligrams to work for people. And therefore, there's very few side effects in your trial. And that's what the PDR has in it, is the registration trial side effects. And this drug doesn't have a lot of side effects at 60 milligrams. It also doesn't have a lot of efficacy at 60 milligrams. And, um, but it's better than placebo. And it turns out the FDA says, this is our rule. It has to be better than placebo. Now, if it were an AIDS drug, what you have to show is a year later, there's zero virus. And therefore, the AIDS drugs are tried at really therapeutic doses. If it works in the trial, it's going to work in your patient. You know why? Because they can't get the FDA to approve it unless a year later the virus is completely suppressed. And that's, what they, that's the requirement for the FDA. Psychiatry's a mess, so we can get by with that. Um, so what is evidence-based medicine? Well, blah, 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 to encourage clinical management decisions based on randomized clinical trials. Now, that wasn't what started out to be. Evidence-based medicine was this. If somebody comes to see you and they're sick in 1965, we want you to have at least read the New England Journal and know something about the condition you're treating as far as we have information about it, rather than your superstitious belief about the way we did things when I was a kid. And medicine was changing more and more rapidly between 1950 and 1990. And as it got more and more rapidly changing in literature, people wanted people to read the literature. A great idea. And they said, look, we want you to know the evidence. However, evidence-based medicine began to be used to regulate what drugs I can give people, what drugs I can't give people. Evidence-based medicine come to mean how we're going to standardize care. Evidence-based medicine came to be part of cost control. And as those things happened, people said, well, a randomized clinical trial is the easiest thing to interpret. Now, there are lots of other kinds of evidence. There's an N of one trial, which several people talked about this morning. If I give somebody nortriptyline at 25 milligrams and they get well, we were talking about this last night, and they're cured on 25 milligrams of nortriptyline, that's good evidence that nortriptyline works for that person, even though everybody else needs 125 milligrams. They don't. Now, if you check their blood level, what you find is it's therapeutic. But, because there are very slow metabolizers who need very low, very low doses. We didn't know that back 25, 30 years ago when I started using nortriptyline. All we knew is that some people got well on low doses and that some people died on high doses. You have to be really careful using it until we figured out how it's metabolized. So, but the push for randomized clinical trials is a push for a standard way of interpreting information that is much more complicated than a standard way will permit. So um, if you have 1,000 patients and you give them drug X versus drug Y and the same percentage get better, those drugs are considered therapeutically equivalent. They're not therapeutic, therapeutically equivalent in my guy. They're therapeutically equivalent in 1,000 guys. So for instance, I treat psychosis in my clinic, and there are about 12 antipsychotic choices that are good on the market right now. And it turns out that some people will only get better on one of those new drug called the Senapine. It's actually an old drug, but it's now being marketed. It was, I was using it in the lab 25 years ago. So it's an old drug, but it finally got, they finally figured out a way to get it into people. Merck spent $900 million to, to, to um, give it as a sublingual tablet. 30% gets absorbed, and that's enough for the drug to work. It's sat on the shelf because if you take it orally, you, dis, you digest it. Um, and by the way, they marketed it in a flavor that I will call poop flavor. If you're going to spend $900 million on a drug, this is for those of you who are just doing startups, taste it before you market it. Because if it has to sit under your tongue for 10 minutes and it tastes like poop, it's going to be a problem. And you're going to have to spend another $100 million to make the black cherry flavor, so, uh, which, is what, which, which is what patients will tolerate. So, uh, the, but a centipede is a, has weird properties. And in some patients, it's the only drug that works. And it's no more expensive than the other drugs. But everybody has a formulary because if you take 1,000 patients, a centipede isn't any better than any of the other antipsychotics. But in an individual patient, it is. So I have a patient who has HIV and lymphoma, and he has persistent olfactory hallucinations that he smells like urine, and none of the other antipsychotics helped him, and a centipede has gotten rid of those. But 
He can't have a Cenepine because his insurance company says, we don't pay for that. We only pay for these other drugs because they're therapeutically equivalent. And I write letters, and I spend hours of time, and I finally, what I did was I, I, um, I got him some Cenepine from the people who make some Merck, and uh, Hopkins has told me I can't give people samples anymore because it's marketing a drug for the company. So right now I'm cheating. I'll probably go to jail for this. <laughs> Trials are reductionistic by nature. They don't represent individual patients. The most ironic thing about evidence-based medicine is there's no evidence that it results in better care in any setting other than those where the trials are conducted. This is a quote from a guy who is reviewing evidence-based medicine, and there's no paper in the literature anywhere that shows that evidence-based medicine is helpful. Now, by the way, there's a bunch of things in medicine that are these really hot, overvalued ideas. For instance, one in medicine right now is Press Ganey's patient satisfaction. Now, I don't like the patient satisfaction thing because I think that the, you're the doctor and the patient didn't go to medical school and probably you should pick the medicine rather than them. And they'll be less satisfied that way. But for years, I have railed as Hopkins has spent millions of dollars a year on patient satisfaction surveys. And I've said this is bad for patients. It's putting them in charge of their treatment, which is bad for them. And I've complained about it. And there's not a single paper until two months ago that ever looked to see whether patient satisfaction improves anything about patient care. And what the paper two months ago in the Archives of Internal Medicine, I'll share it with you if you want to see it, shows, is that increased patient satisfaction correlates with increased mortality. <laughs> and I've showed that slide everywhere in America that I can get people to listen to it because it is exactly what you would expect. If you picked the medicine, at least you went to medical school. You may be a moron, but the other guy didn't even go to medical school. <laughs> this is not better medicine. This is politically correct medicine. So this is a table of evidence-based medicine hierarchy, a randomized clinical trial with an N of 1, like I told you, my guy, who gets better on it. But what people are really saying is systemic review of randomized clinical trials are the best. This is a meta-analysis. Um, so evidence-based medicine is poorly defined. Nobody knows what the hierarchy should be. Trials data are variably applicable to practice. The inclusion exclusion criteria are all screwed up. There's no clear evidence that evidence-based medicine makes things better. And the data is misused to restrict care. This is a quote from a, a primary care doctor writing in the Canadian Journal. I'm concerned because to practice evidence-based medicine only denigrates clinical judgment and experience. It is a simplistic cookbook approach, an excuse for not thinking that renders all patients with a particular condition the same, to be treated the same way. It's the antithesis of holistic medicine, strips away the art, the same time cheapens the value of professional practice. And that's what they want to do, by the way. They want, a little, they want to give Dr. Fine a little thing, and he looks at it, and he says, well, you have these diagnostic criteria, so you have this, and here's the algorithm for treating you. And any social worker, nurse, anybody can do it. And that's wonderful, because it decreased costs. It's bad for the patients, because they die more, but it does decrease cost. And everybody sees this. Now, by the way, this isn't what evidence-based medicine started out to be. And it's not the way most people use the term, but it is the way the term is being misused. Um, I already told you that. So this is a really cool uh, uh, little paper. And what it, we did was look at beta blockers after myocardial infarction. Now back in 1967, uh, when I was uh, uh, just going into science, um, we learned that beta blockers after MI protect patients from mortality. And we knew it. We knew if you gave people beta blockers, they survived. This first clinical trial didn't show that. And this first, the second clinical trial didn't show that. And the third clinical trial didn't show it. The fourth one may have showed it. But look, from 1967 to 1981, none of the clinical trials really shows benefit of beta blockers after MI. And then we figured out how to do the trials, and they all show it. But gee, if you meta-analyzed these trials with these trials, you wouldn't give anybody a beta blocker after MI. But it's obvious what happened. We figured it out. We figured out how to do the experiment so that it works. I didn't have to metal analyze every experiment I did with rats when I was in the laboratory looking at dopamine receptors with every experiment that failed because I would have never published anything. Because the way you figure stuff out is by doing the experiment over and over. I couldn't, the first 20 times I tried to purify calmodulin to a single band, it failed. When I got it to be a single band in time 21, 
I was allowed to use it. I didn't have to go back, take the first 20 batches and mix them in. <laughs> These are experiments. So here's the most expensive trial you guys have paid for to date. This is the American uh, Journal's publication of the Katie trial. And the Katie trial was designed to compare all the different antipsychotic medicines I told you about a few minutes ago and to give them to different people. And um, there was an early cohort without uh, ziprazidone and a late cohort with ziprazidone added in. So the lanzapine, perfenazine, quetiapine, risperidone, and ziprazidone. And perfenazine is an old style antipsychotic. And it was included because it is incredibly cheap. These other drugs are expensive. And uh, this drug causes tardive dyskinesia. And these drugs hardly ever cause tardive dyskinesia. And they did this trial. And um, they had uh, these five different cells. And one of the things, and, and they divided them up. Look, this is supposed to be one to four. And look, they have 118 people. And they had an N of 33 with a tardive dyskinesia, an N of 34 with tardive dyskinesia, and an N of 35. They divided them up really well. Their one to four ratios worked. Problem is, whoop, um, there were five drugs in four strata, 57 sites, 12 sites had groups containing only 15 patients or less, 16 cells with an unbalanced design, and every site had at least one empty cell where they didn't recruit to. And different people were recruiting to all these cells. And the largest site only had four patients with tardive dyskinesia. So the data weren't very comparable. And what they got out of this is, guess what? All the antipsychotics are equal. And they didn't have hardly any cases of tardive dyskinesia with perfenazine because they used it as a low dose, and they didn't do the trial very long. Tardive dyskinesia, 10% of your people get tardive dyskinesia with perfenazine. And they said, oh, you guys used to use too high doses. It's just as good. Um, patients were stable, which minimizes clinical effect. The patients were switched at the outset. And the most important thing is the endpoint was not improvement clinically. It was whether the patient stopped the drug or kept going. What this trial showed at $50 million cost to you is that schizophrenic patients don't stay on their medicine. <laughs> I could have told you that for $20 million. <laughs> this is the guy who did the Katie trial. Um, can we handle the truth? Two large non-commercial clinics comparing first and second generation haven't shown any difference. The new drugs were no more effective or better tolerated than the older drugs. Crap! Number one, they didn't, in fact, show that. This was, a, uh, this, this was not powered to be a superiority, to, uh, to be an equivalence trial. It was powered to be a superiority trial. So it was underpowered to actually show that they were equivalent. And it didn't show equivalence. What it showed is nothing. And they have interpreted that to mean, well, of course, it was their 50 million bucks that they spent of your money, and they wanted to get another grant someday. So they wrote stuff like this. But in fact, this trial showed nothing except for one thing. This is a little Australian psychiatrist who I love named, um, uh, oh, sorry. This is the increase in use of perfenazine. It doesn't look like much, but it's a tenfold increase in the use of a drug we should never use. Um, this is Dr. Bick. What he said is, the study failed to remove anything significant important in psychopharmacological treatment of schizophrenia, but it did expose a woeful standard in medical management of schizophrenia offered by psychiatrists and they didn't mention, they didn't treat diabetes, they didn't treat hyperlipidemia, and they didn't treat hypertension when lots of patients had those things. And Dr. Bick was right. Um, some of the results were expensive confirmation of known prior results. The stunning finding was that psychiatrists ignored life-threatening treatable medical conditions in patients presenting for treatment with schizophrenia. That's Dr. Bick, and he's right. I love him. Nobody in the United States said that, by the way. He's in Australia, and Lieberman can't go over there and beat him up. Um, the clinical trials don't really represent most clinical circumstances because they have these inclusion criteria, and the majority of the patients don't exactly fit the inclusion criteria of clinical trials that I see. So this is coronary bypass surgery. Um, only 4% of people getting a bypass now make criteria to be in the studies that we used to prove it worked. So 96% of people are getting this pr procedure with no clinical evidence, except that the fact that they're alive 20 years later. My father had bypassed when he was 70, 68. Anyway, he's, he's 80 now. He looks pretty good. Without the bypass, he wouldn't be here. I know this. 
But clinical trials would, don't apply to him because he wouldn't have made criteria to be in them. So the classic research confounds are specificity, sensitivity, and reliability of validity. I'm going to talk about those for a minute. But um, let's talk about depression. So patients come to me with complex conditions, and I give them antidepressants, and they get better. A lot of them get better, and I get people better who have not gotten better with anybody else. Not because I'm better, but because I'm more persistent and I don't give up. And eventually I get them better. Two years later, three years later, they're better. And then they stop their medicine because they felt fine. They didn't need it anymore. And I say, it's the medicine that got you feeling fine. Oh, told you that. Now, I've been dealing with that for 25 years. It's very frustrating. Everybody stops their medicine. I want to kill them, but they go back on it. We fight. Eventually, they take the medicine. But now, to make things more interesting, there's a bunch of papers out that show antidepressants don't work. There are large-scale meta-analyses that show antidepressants don't work. This is from the Wall Street Journal. Few people realize that half the people who try antidepressants stop them after taking three months. No, it's not half. It's all of them, even if, even if they work. The most popular antidepressants on the market only work for about half the people who try them. Of course, but then 25% more get better on the next one, and if you actually look, you can get about 90% of people well. This is gobbledygook, but it came out in the, in the wake of this other two other studies I'm going to show you. So this is uh, Mark Twain. There are three kinds of lies, lies, damn lies, and statistics. A meta-analysis, a method that takes complex data sets that result in conflicting conclusions and by introducing a number of biases and assumptions that further confound the data, they reach a clearer conclusion. I said that. And it made all the evidence-based medicine people really mad. They hate me. Um, so this is uh, Turner's paper in the New England Journal of This is one of the two papers that has really been a problem. And they said, look, there's papers that are published that, in, that agree with the FDA decision, then there's papers that are published that conflict, and then there's a bunch of non-published papers. And guess what? When you do a trial and it doesn't work, you don't publish it much. <laughs> I never published a failed experiment in my whole career. Because if you submit a failed experiment for publication, they reject it. <laughs> because it failed. You did it wrong. And he says the unpublished papers mute the published papers. Yes, that's right. If you let the failed experiments average them with the successful experiments, you will often mute most of what you, most of what you do. That's right. You wouldn't be able to measure the speed of light every time because the first 50 times you measured it, you did it wrong. So we'd have to average it, and we wouldn't know what the speed of light is. And what you find is it's true that the, they, we publish more of the positive results than the negative results. So when you mix them together, you get much less of effect. And actually, you can show that the antidepressants don't work at all. Um, <clears throat> and this is Kirsch's uh, paper, which is worse. When unpublished trial data include overall benefit is not significant, he put together all the trials. And um, this is the Hamilton severity. And this is improvement in numbers. And um, the drug is blue, and placebo is yellow. And the only clinically significant difference is in people who are really sick out here with a Hamilton of 28. And these are all no different. And he said, see, the antidepressants don't work. The Wall Street Journal said that. Time Magazine said it. Everybody said it. My patients stopped taking their medicines even more. And they say, well, Dr. Eastman, you're not reading the literature. <laughs> we all know these medicines don't work. I kill them when they say that. Discouraging data on the antidepressant. <laughs> Lab work is hard. Um, so when I went to graduate school, um, the ECA study that was just coming out, and they found that the prevalence of major depression in the United States is 4 to 6 percent. And um, that's what it is in England for about 50 years where they've actually done real epidemiology in England, it's been 50 years, it's been 4%. And 20 years later, they did the National Comorbidity Study, and they said it's 16%. We had a fourfold increase in depression in the United States in 20 years. By the way, it's the same 20 years where the antidepressant efficacy disappeared. Know what's happening? 
So this is a study from GMA that it seems like nobody ever saw except me. Because when I show it to people, they say, oh, I never saw that. It's the most important paper around for this issue. This is placebo, <clears throat> this is tricyclics, and this is SSRIs, and this is the last 20 years. And look what happens. The placebo goes up to double, and the antidepressants go up. And the distance between the two curves is exactly the same as it was 20 years ago. The difference is the error bars out here make the trials statistically insignificant because you have a 40% placebo response. When do you have a 40% placebo response? When you're not treating anything. When you're treating everybody put together. So what is depression? Well, I'm going to tell you about two kinds of depression. There's this kind of depression. For today, I'm going to call it demoralization. Every one of you has had this. This is the understandable psychological sadness that you have over adversity. You don't get your grant funded. You don't get the money to start your startup. Your paper doesn't get published. You wake up one morning, you're the AIDS psychiatrist at Hopkins. The <laughs> These things can happen, even to good people. I have a PhD. <laughs> and you get demoralized, and you say, I'm depressed, and you feel depressed. And your friends talk to you, and they say, look, it's, it's going to be OK. You're, look, you're a full professor of medicine psychiatry. You're not doing too badly. And it's embarrassing to be a psychiatrist, but you're also a real doctor. And <laughs> this responds to time, encouragement, support. This does not get better with antidepressant in any good trial ever done. Antidepressants have zero efficacy with this condition in basic science studies and in clinical studies, if they're well done. This is major depression. It's a disease of your brain. In your brain is a little circuit called the ascending mesolimbic dopamine circuit. I can show you this circuit. I can model it in basic science experiments, and I can screw around with it. That circuit's job is to give you a, yeah, when you get a grant. Any grant? You know, yeah. Someone says, great tie? Yeah. Great food? Yeah. Your wife says, I'm coming with you to Colorado? Yeah. Right? And 4% um, of the population has a disease where this periodically turns itself off. And nothing gives you a, yeah. And some of the people, when they get that, are sad. They have depression. Other people, when they get that, aren't sad. They have depression, but they say, I'm not depressed. In fact, they're irritable and cranky. Or they're flat and apathetic. But the core, tech, core problem is this. You say, what do you really love to do? And they say, bowling. And you say, when you go bowling, do you enjoy it? And they say, well, not for a while. I kind of I just do it because it's what it's supposed to do. You know? My patient who taught me this was a bowler. And um, he came to me. And he, his internist had sent me to me repeatedly. And I, he wouldn't come. But when he finally came, he said, you know, Dr. Treisman, for a few years now, things haven't been as good at work as they should be. They're, they're OK. But I'm, I'm not getting fired, but they're not like they should be. And things with my wife aren't as good as they should be either. But you know, now this is starting to affect my bowling. <laughs> so now I will see a psychiatrist. And uh, when I gave him uh, bupropion, an antidepressant, and he got well, he said, you know, when I was sick, I would get a strike. I'd think, eh, that's what's supposed to happen. But now that I get a strike, I get a little, yeah. I turn around to my team. They, I got it from this guy. He's, I turn around to my team. He's going, yeah. And I think depression is a disease of your yeah receptors. <laughs> and that physiologically is a good match for what you can find in the lab. Because you can ablate these receptors by giving people uh, drugs, and then nothing gives them a yeah. And we've done that to people with uh, antihypertensive drugs, reserpine. And it was a perfectly good antihypertensive, except a lot of the patients killed themselves, which, we, we, which was considered a side effect, by the way. And <laughs> even the VA has stopped using it. Um, but. Uh, so these are different things. And if you say, if you study this, which is what we started studying in the 1970s, antidepressants are great for this. But if you just say, are you depressed? Come on into this study. Then you get a bunch of people with this. And they don't get better on the antidepressants. And you get a big placebo response, right? And that's what's happened. We've just mixed these things together in those trials. You know why we mix them together? Because if you're running a trial in 1970, you're at an academic medical center, and you very carefully diagnose your patients, because you're part of the research, and your name's going on the paper. But if you're doing a trial now, in the year 2010, 
a drug company is paying you to recruit for that trial, and you get $4,000 if you can get someone to be in the trial. And you say, yeah, I think he's depressed enough to go in the trial, because you get 4000 bucks. You think we're over, we're over recruiting? Absolutely. Also, in 1970, we didn't know much about depression. Someone has to come to you now and not have, an, have that antidepressant for years, usually one year, no antidepressant treatment, and be depressed. How many people are floating around now who have severe, real major depression and haven't gotten treatment? Unless they're in the AIDS clinic, none. So when is it pneumonia? If you say it's pneumonia when someone has cough, fever, and sputum, you intervene early, you give them an antibiotic, and you do great. And if you wait until they have a positive culture done through a bronchoscopy and give it antibiotics, you're, you, you do much better with the antibiotics because you don't waste them, but a few of the people die because you waited a little too long. And someplace on here is the time when you treat. Young, healthy person who's been to your office 50 times with bronchitis comes in saying, I need an antibiotic. You say, no. 83-year-old guy comes in the last two times he came in with a cough. He was intubated. You say, here's some penicillin. So you, where you intervene clinically is determined by knowing the patient. If you're doing a research study and you can take these people who have a cough, fever, and sputum and you compare an antibiotic with a cough suppressant, you get the same thing we get with antidepressants, no difference. But if you take these people and did the same study, you'd find the antidepressants, the, anti, uh, the antibiotics work and the cough suppressants do nothing. So the same thing is true with depression. If you say, we're going to look at people who are sad and have a low mood, vital sense, and self-attitude, that's when I want to treat you. 4% of the population has the condition, but we're going to treat 16% of the population so we don't miss anybody because the antidepressants kill 1 in 50,000 people and 10 to 20% of people with a real condition kill themselves. So if I don't treat them and they kill themselves, that's bad. If I give them an antidepressant, they have a side effect, big deal. And they're going to stop it anyway, like everybody does. So, um, so treatment, I want to intervene early. But if I'm doing a diagnostic study, if I'm doing a study to look at a clinical trial, I want to take these people. And we don't have an x-ray, like a chest x-ray or a bronch yet, for major depression. So you have to use very careful clinical criteria. But we're not doing that. We're using DSM criteria. So if you use, this is sensitive, so you include too many people and you don't miss anybody. This is specific, but it leaves people out and it's better, more, more research accuracy. So where are you gonna cut off your trial? Here, here, or here? If you cut it off here, this will be an accurate reflection of how many people will get better in the real world. If you cut it off here, this will be an accurate reflection of what the drug is actually doing with people who have the condition. You, you get this, right? Is, is anybody having trouble with this concept? And yet, the whole field of psychiatry has no idea about this. Am I lying about this? It's so frustrating. These people went to medical school, and then what happened? Their brains fell out. <laughs> the first course you take in medical school, the first course is epidemiology, and all they talk about is sensitivity, specificity, reliability, and validity. And yet, it's evaporated from our, uh, our, uh, our literature. Um, so patient factors, research design factors, and investigator factors all influence how clinical trials go. When we think we know something really well, like schizophrenia, the, the ECA data and the national government get exactly the same number, because we really know what this is. Bipolar, it doubles, because we sort of know what this is. PTSD, eightfold increase. We hardly know what this is. We certainly don't know what adult ADHD is. In major depression, we sort of know what it is, but it goes up fourfold. It didn't go up fourfold because there's more depression. It, got, it went up fourfold because we increased our sensitivity and decreased our specificity. It's not that complicated, really. Now, in order to increase it and decrease it more, we now have a four-item measure of depression and anxiety, which has been standardized, and I'm told has, it's an ultra-brief self-report questionnaire that has the same reliability and validity in a general population as anything else we do. Now, that may be true, but it scares the crap out of me. Um, so these are the statistics that show it works just as well as anything. And these are the people who validated it. They're a company that has four employees and yet somehow managed to 
pulled together a group of real experts who went out and validated this study in Germany. Um, and they usually, by the way, put on meetings. But they were the cheapest bidder to do this study. This is where I should talk about STAR-D, the antidepressant trial, but I won't because I will spare you. Because Dr. McHugh said, spare us. Um, it's so terrible. It was a trial to show which antidepressants are best. And guess what? They're all the same. 50 million. Thank you very much. Now, what you're seeing now is a push to have a symptom-based classification in other things in medicine. Because psychiatry, of course, is infectious to the rest of medicine. So we're going to look at irritable bowel syndrome. And irritable bowel syndrome um, and functional bowel disorders are very important. So we need a symptom-based class for clinical trials. And here's the criteria for irritable bowel syndrome, at least 12 weeks, which don't need to be consecutive in the last year of abdominal discomfort and pain, two of the three following usages, relieved with defecation or onset with a change in frequency of stool or onset associated with a change in the form of stool. None of you have this, right? <laughs> you don't have to have these things, but these further support the diagnosis. Fewer than three bowel movements a week, more than three bowel movements a day, lumpy... Loose stools, lumpy stools, hard stools, straining, urgency, feeling of incomplete bowel movement, passing mucus, abdominal fullness, bloating, or swelling. Uh, depends on where you eat. Um, if you want to call it diarrhea-predominant irritable bowel or constipation-predominant irritable bowel, you can size these. You see how good this is? Guess what kind of data you're going to get from it. It looks like an antidepressant <laughs> trial. This is all the irritable bowel... Uh, placebo-controlled uh, irritable bowel trials of drugs uh, summarized in uh, gastro, uh, neurogastromotility, uh, and uh, there's 40% placebo response. Look, the longer you go and the more patients you have, the closer you get to 40%, just like I'm getting in my trials. You know why? Because these criteria don't make criteria. These aren't careful, thoughtful diagnoses or based on a marker. Now. I want these guys to come up with a way to diagnose depression. But if I tell them these people have depression and half of them don't have it, they're not going to be able to give me anything because they're not getting a phenotype. And the problem is the whole field is convinced you can get the phenotype with that four-question questionnaire. This is over time. The further out you get, the more close you get to 40%. Now I'll show you this really cool study. This is my last study. Um, this is from the last neuroscience meeting. Um, so uh, this is a salmon. And it was told to uh, look at uh, photographs depicting humans in social situations <laughs> with a specified emotional valence. And the salmon was asked to determine what emotion the individual in the photo had been experiencing. <laughs> How can you laugh at this? Those changes are statistically significant. <laughs> Sam? Here's the best part. Oh, well, these are the statistics. I won't take you through them. Here's the best part. It's a post-mortem salmon. <laughs> the salmon was dead. In the dead salmon, you can show a statistically different scan when you show it different pictures of human beings. <laughs> because if you're an uncritical thinker and you're not really looking at the phenotype and you're not really testing a hypothesis and you're not critical about what your outcome might mean, you get mud. And we are getting a lot of mud in my field. And I want my patients to have omics. I want this group, I want Dr. Gold to come up with a way that I can take some blood from somebody or some urine from somebody and say, this person is having a depressive episode that will respond to bupropion. But if I give him people who are, who are dead salmon <laughs> and say, this is the same as these other people who have the disease, I'm going to get nothing. By the way, you can identify people with major depression with pretty good reliability and pretty good validity. But it takes a long time, it's very expensive, and it's hard to do, and you have to be highly trained to do it. And he could do it, 
but kids who are being educated now can't do it because they're learning the DSM checklist method. You go to the DSM and you say, is this, 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 and this. And I had this happen to me yesterday. I admitted a patient with bipolar disorder who for five years was manic and crazy and was about to lose his career. And I admitted him to the hospital. We got his mania under control. And naturally, after a long mania, you get depression. And he swung down into a terrible depression. And I admitted him, and the resident called me and said, I don't think this guy has depression. I think he has generalized anxiety disorder because he's very anxious. He makes criteria for generalized anxiety disorder. I said, what about he was in the hospital three months ago and he believed he could move objects with his mind and now he feels like he can't get up and go to work even though he's worth more than your entire extended family will be with, worth their whole lives. He's an incredibly successful guy who's a partner in a firm that makes more money than Hopkins makes. And you're telling me that the guy has generalized anxiety disorder, which he just developed at age 60? Uh, I'll, I'll think about it. But he had criteria. He doesn't have the condition. He just has the criteria. So these things are different. You have to know and understand why they're different before you can go understand the phenotype. And if you don't understand the phenotype, you don't get anywhere. So evidence-based medicine emphasizes application research in a manner divorced from descriptive and experimental research. Artifacts abound in research, and critical appraisal of the assumptions of a study are as important as the data. And exclusive criteria show effect size, while inclusive criteria are likely to show the application result. Reliability is useless without validity. By the way, everybody wants to use these criteria because they're reliable. If he uses them, if he uses them, and I use them, we all get the same answer. It's wrong, but it's the same. We want validity. We are more than passive recipients of medical knowledge base. We are its custodians and ever vigilant to weed out the inaccuracies that might mislead, be misused to keep our patients from getting the best possible treatment. And that is a daunting task right now. <laughs> My son's not doing very well in school. I think he has ADHD. Give him some speed. I think the dosage is adjusting. I'm not nearly as happy as the people in the ads. <laughs> so um, psychiatry is a field in tremendous trouble right now because of outside pressures. The pressure to do it faster, cheaper, and, uh, and have better outcomes with no thought to what happens if you don't adequately treat the patients. So in my AIDS clinic, where 50% of the patients who come from medical care have a psychiatric disorder other than addiction, and 75% have an addiction. Those are the people who are spreading the epidemic. They are the people most likely to infect somebody else. They don't get good medical treatment because they're psychiatrically ill and they don't take the medicines very well. And yet there's no funding for people to do psychiatry there. And what they want to do is have checklists and algorithms to treat everybody. And it doesn't work. So, I tell people to raise hell and demand more resources for mentally ill people, but I also tell people to think critically about what they learn about psychiatry because it really is a discipline of medicine. If you just apply the principles we apply to everything else, it's not complicated. You guys have no trouble understanding it. When I gave this talk at Hopkins, one of my former students said to me, so you don't believe in evidence-based medicine. <laughs> the problem is it's not a religion, okay? Science and religion are different. Not believing in evidence-based medicine makes it into a religion. Now, it's become a religion, but it isn't. It's a criticizable, thinkable set of data that you can look at and say that means this rather than that. Anyway, I'll stop. Thank you guys for inviting me.